welcome ladies and gentlemen we are very glad to see we have a large audience from across the world today and rightly so as we have dr batra with us today so i think we're all unfortunately aware of how for over a year now covid-19 has disrupted lives globally the global covid death toll has already crossed the 3 million mark it is clear now that the virus will leave its unfortunate imprints on both the global economy and geopolitics but what remains shrouded in mystery is its origin although it is well established that the virus emerged from wuhan due to the political agenda of governments and scientists its exact origins remains obscure while some point to wuhan's wet markets and its wild livestock as a source for a zoonotic transmission several ground reports have contested the legitimacy of this claim a parallel narrative of the virus having originated from a laboratory and spilled intentionally or by accident has gained traction today we have with us dr batra who has been one of the first most global voices advocating the need for a transparent inquiry into the origins of the virus he has sent open letters to president biden former president trump and prime minister modi on the need to expose the raw truth surrounding the origins of the covid virus dr batra welcome we are humbled and honored to have you here with us thank you so much thank for taking our invitation so pleasure to join you rushali and abina uh it is not offered that i I'm, i expect to get tortured by two such wonderful people and um you know i have not been referred to as dr batra since i gave up teaching law um 35 years ago but um thank you very nice to be with you thank you auntie with yeah. respect to what you've said um the first uh, you know there were there is a series of three letters the first letter was on april 14 2020 to then president trump uh which is the the backbone of my open letters frankly uh and then at the one year anniversary i wrote to president biden who's a wonderful wonderful man um and you know his moral compass is well calibrated and um so i i wrote him that's now a one year anniversary uh what's the status of what we're doing uh kind of thing and but then uh i noticed with in a very short order uh after writing to president biden on april 13 of 2021 um i i saw what was happening in india and it seemed that my thinking as a lawyer which is you know crime and punishment or if some, someone does something wrong or someone bangs up your car they should pay for it so instead of principles of tort liability or crime and punishment which is which was the state of mind i had when i first wrote to president trump a year ago seeing what was happening in india made it clear to me that this is a virus that is beyond crime and punishment this is a virus that we all need to come together around to disarm it's it's almost like an icbm of a virus uh and so i said to uh, in my letter to prime minister modi uh and i thought that it was uh historically appropriate that you know we should instead move from the paradigm of crime and punishment or damages and reparations rather to desmond tutu of archbishop of uh, south africa his truth and reconciliation commission because what we are lacking frankly even today is the exact information that makes this virus tick and if you don't know the problem all of your solutions are like a shotgun approach it's not a sniper it's not like you can take it out like with a surgical scalpel instead you're trying to hit a lot of areas hoping that you will catch it but the fact is this virus continues to mutate to more lethality a normal virus a natural virus mutates down into harmlessness that you can hug and kiss it and never get sick this one is getting more and more lethal which is also a a, a direct evidence of its lab creation but to go back i want to just because this will be i think critical um to uh, to this conversation i'm actually going to read to you five or six lines from my letter to president trump it's on page 3 of my open letter uh of april 14 2020 and which by the way i must with, a, with i give you two disclaimers a i sent it to my friend the uh deputy, deputy national security advisor matt pottinger at the time and that's how it ended up on president trump's desk the next day and the very next day 
after my, the science in my letter was confirmed, the United States launched its investigation of China. That's one disclaimer. Second, I happen to love the Chinese culture. I, I mean, I think Confucius is one of the best philosophers uh, anyone has ever seen. And the Chinese civilization has given us plenty uh, as a human race to celebrate. So this is not about Chinese people. This is not about Chinese culture. It frankly, my, my issue is dealing with the, the People's Liberation Army owned and operated Wuhan Virology Lab, okay? That's all we're talking about. So I wanna read to you the, uh, the, a little bit of, under the heading critical evidence, the mysterious gene sequencing. The coronavirus, AKA 2019 ends COVID, has 100% amino acid similarity to NPC7 and E proteins with BAT, SL, COVID, Z, C45, and BAT, SL, COVID, Z, X, C21. But worst of all, the 2019 N COVID has a reverse engineered and grafted on in a lab of the natural to bats, natural to bats, not to you and I, natural to bats, a receptor binding domain structure, the mushrooms on the surface that we see on the, the coronavirus of SARS-CoV, i.e. a transplantation of the spike glycor protein S, the natural mushroom on the surface of SARS-CoV is in a lab genetically added or spliced, grafted onto a 20 novel COVID, which I have from personal experience with I had coronavirus a year ago, called a Trojan horse. To have a friendly handshake is in fact accurate biochemically as the receptor binding unlocks the human cell and enters the human body easily. Essentially, that thing that you see, that beautiful bouquet of flowers on this coronavirus, this death virus, those beautiful mushrooms uh, trick the body, our immune system, to think it's a friendly, it's not, it's not, an, it's not a burglar, it's a friend. So it's, it's got a master key to get past our autoimmune our immune system. So it comes in, and then like a Trojan horse, it's welcomed into our bodies, and then, of course, the enemy soldiers come out and, and do all sorts of havoc. So exactly correct. This is transplanted. Now, what's critical in the same paragraph in the last sentence, the SARS bat SL COVID ZC45. That's the original SARS virus. Remember in 2003? Guess what? With its natural bat-based mushrooms on the surface, they could not enter human beings. The original SARS virus in its natural state could not enter human beings. Hence, no zoonotic animal to human transmission. So except for the fact that the, there was gain of function as Senator Rand Paul has talked about, the gain of function research that was done, which is weaponizing, it's bio warfare. It's weaponizing a virus, okay? So instead of dropping nuclear bombs, you know, drop a virus and look what, what's happened. Millions of people have, are dying and will continue to die unless we disarm this. So my plea at this point, frankly, is we need to get the, we need to get the world, and India is certainly a large part of it and an important part of it, to get President Xi to say, listen, Forget about crime and punishment. Forget about international criminal court of you know in, in the Hague. Forget about crimes against humanity because that's not going to save humanity. If we don't disarm this virus, there's no one left. No, there's no one left even for China to dominate. So for their own sake, because they'll have no one to dominate, um, and the rest of us, we need to get this thing solved. Now, just a week ago in England, you know, there's two professors who came out that there is a study uh, which will be released in, in a few days that they have uh, determined, and uh, Rashali, you'll forgive me for using this, you know, there's a difference between a blonde and a, a natural blonde and, a, and a, a blonde that comes out of a hairdresser having hair dye. Well, these two scientists 
uh, who are releasing their study in the next few days can prove that the coronavirus was made to look like it was natural. It wasn't natural. It was a dyed blonde, if you, if you understand the metaphor I'm making. It was not a natural blonde. So now for China to do that, you don't have to bother doing that if, if the virus was natural. But because it's not natural, because it's bio-warfare, gain of function, it's transplanted, now you got to cover your tracks. And that's all we have. Definitely, sir. I completely agree with you. And in fact, I thank you for simplifying the scientific aspects of it in terms which we completely understand. And as far as your analogy concerns, I think, sir, you put it very aptly and how China has been fairly successful in covering up its tracks, to use your words. Uh, but so before we uh, proceed, uh, I think it's only fair that first I introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, although you, you, of course, need no introduction, but I have very painstakingly sort of summarized your very many achievements in a few lines. So before we proceed, I'll just begin with your short bio. Uh, so Dr. Ravi Patra is an American lawyer, businessman, political writer, and philanthropist. After teaching business law in New York, Mr. Batra founded a private boutique law firm that specializes in complex and high-profile constitutional sovereignty, torture, civil and criminal cases. Since 2007, he chairs the National uh, Advisory Council on South Asian Affairs, a foreign policy think tank, and interacts with the U.S. Congress and Department of State. Having served as a legal advisor to the permanent mission of Honduras, India, and Ukraine, to the United Nations and consulting several others over the years, Mr. Batra became increasingly involved in the diplomatic and political process at the United Nations and beyond. The primary areas of his public intellectual interest include the matters of war and peace, international security, fight against terrorism, international conflict management, and sustainable energy. Once again, Mr. Batra. Uh, and uh, before we can uh, proceed, I'll just uh, have some a few ground rules is that we would request all our speak all our uh, participants to please mute yourselves uh, throughout the interview. We will have a question and answer session. We're trying to keep this interview within 40 minutes. Uh, our partner News X will be streaming this on their platform. So I'd like to now invite uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Abhinav Pandya, founder of USANAS, to just give a few words and take this conversation forward. Dr. Pandya, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Hello. Am I? Thank you very much, Dr. Patra and uh, Rushali. In fact, I should be apologizing because interview is uh, pretty much in its flow and I'm kind of intervening, but just making a few opening remarks. Uh, I would really like to thank Dr. Patra for joining us today. And uh, I mean, it's really amazing. I guess you were one just of call the- me, Ravi. Just call me Ravi. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. You, so the uh, the uh, interview which you gave to the U.S. newspaper, and I mean, I read it. Uh, some of the uh, the things which you mentioned, especially the scientific aspects, they were absolutely shocking and interesting. I mean, because we were also talking about uh, this lab leak issues in India, but you know, it was more or less about things going in the vacuum, you know, with no concrete basis. But the facts which you highlighted, you know, they were extraordinary. And I mean, you were one of the earliest voices to highlight this issue, the origins, the lab origins of this virus. So I guess today it's a great discussion, you know, and I mean, certainly this issue has completely shaken the entire human existence today. So we do need a solution. And one more thing before we just move on with the interview, I, I mean, I would, which is with which I would rather leave or begin the interview is that uh, we are faced with an adversary which has a very clear cut and a committed vision to dominate the world you know and it's not just about this one virus but this adversary or china will be coming out with many other ways to sabotage the institutions which we have created the culture of democracy which we have created like what they have been doing recently with india you know we just saw the example so we have to come out with a strategy to either to contain this or counter this and save the humanity Oh, with this, I'll just end, you know, and uh, once again, I would also welcome all our eminent participants today, uh, Ambassador Trigunath, sir, Gautam Sen, sir, Mr. Pankaj Madan, Ambassador Pandey, sir, and all the participants. So, uh, sorry for this, uh, this uh, little intervention, and uh, Rushali, over to you. No, I, but I want to respond to what you said, because you've said a lot. Uh, first of all, uh, a pleasure to be with you, and as a founder of the foundation that you have, uh, it's a delight to be with you. One. Second, 
um, we need to separate out. Every human civilization has had at some point in its life span a desire to become a, become an empire or sometimes become an empire again. So, uh, you know, that's meritocracy at a sovereign level instead of an individual level. So if somebody is using bullets and gunpowder uh, or acceptable forms of war, which is even nuclear weapons, which we don't want to use, but we, we dropped them in, in Japan after World War, you know, during World War II. So there are acceptable means of war, but we have determined as a human race that chemical weapons are not allowed and bio-warfare weapons are not allowed. So it's, it's an illegal weapon of war. It's an illegal weapon of domination. So whatever's going on between India and China at the border is a geopolitical issue. And you know you can go back to 1949, the Karachi Agreement, uh, which took most of the land that uh, Raja Hari Singh gave to India as part of the unity. You know, it would be like, for example, when we bought Louisiana, from Napoleon, because Napoleon was going broke, uh, nobody in Louisiana said, well, we're going to make a separate country. You bought it from Napoleon, but you know, we're going to become a separate country. There's no such creature. Louisiana is part of the United States, similarly with Alaska, when we bought from the Tsar uh, of Russia at the time. So what happened with India is really peculiar because it was unable to keep what it had received. And, and so all of the stuff that's happened uh, is kind of very strange. Uh, but, you know, lawyers are different, politicians are different, statesmen are different, you know, uh, and of course, soldiers are different. So I just wanted to say to you, the issue you're talking about, like the border, deals with the Karachi Agreement in 49, which came out in 1990s, became public, the Tibet uh, 58, the 62 war. You know, you have to understand, Chairman Mao, is one of the most exceptional military leaders in human history. Nobody acknowledges that, but you must give credit where credit is due. This man figured out that there was something called the Golan Heights before Golda Meir did in, 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 in Israel. So he decided from the day uh, People's Republic of China was born, that he was going to build, forget the Great Wall of China, he was going to get the Golan Heights, which was the Himalayas. So the 49 Agreement, the Tibet 58 acquisition, uh, the 62 War, you know, these were all to complete the, the Golan Heights. Now, since since 62 War, whatever's been left, you know, loose or, or border little uh, gaps, those are being filled in militarily. And, you know, and of course, Prime Minister Modi as the head of an independent state uh, who's protecting his state, he's doing what he's got to keep, do to keep his border. Um, because if you don't have your, if your border isn't locked, you know, your, your, your home's door should be open to visitors that you want and guests that you want, but not burglars. So you should be able to invite people in. People shouldn't be able to just come in. I mean, and that's true, of course, for China as well. Nobody should go into Chinese territory without an invitation from China. So international law basically says where our rights end, yours begin, but you can't intrude into our rights. Okay, so I mean, I, I, I couldn't just pass that up with you because I don't want to confuse this coronavirus with the border conflict or or what's going on in the South China Sea, you know, with with the mischief reef or all, all the other stuff that's going on, or the dual use of OBOR. It's, it's being sold as a commercial venture when it also has military application. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Batra. Thank you. I think the point that you highlighted require another interview in itself, and of course, we'd love to have, your, have another interview with you and hear your views on that. But coming back to the topic at our hand, I think a pressing question right now is that it's been over a year since the original theory of bat animal human transmission from Wuhan's wet markets has happened, despite, of course, being no concrete evidence for being provided by Beijing on the same. So according to you, why is this question on the origins of COVID virus heating up and reopening now again? Well, you have to understand that policymakers, so whether it's President Trump, uh, who I give great credit to because he got my letter on April 14th of last year. And the very next day, after having confirmed the science in my letter, he launched the investigation. 
The problem with policymakers and, and heads of governments is that they're not scientists. They're not, math they're not mathematicians. They're not uh, doctors of medicine. So hence, all of this technical stuff becomes mumbo jumbo. So unless, and generally analysts do not have access to policymakers. They have to go through their organizational chart. And as you go through your organizational chart, to each of your, each boss above them, they become administrative uh, and away from the science or the math or the medicine. And hence, by the time it gets to the, the leadership, it becomes mumbo jumbo. You can't explain it. So my benefit is that I'm able to talk to policymakers directly. And so I have the access and I jealously guard it because if I'm not sure of something, I say it. And if I, if I make a mistake, I say it because my word to me matters. It, you know, personal honor is not just about how you dress, it's just, it's, your word is your bond. So when I wrote the letter to President Trump and I'm saying to the most powerful country on earth, I think we have a problem here. Forget about the chemical weapons or use or not use in Doma in Syria, because there's a great, great bigger fight with that, with OPCW. Forget about that. This, on the other hand, is a transplanted, lab-created Trojan horse, and which is going to get, and which is getting more and more lethal. And by the way. I have been, I, I, for example, I, I got vaccinated with the second shot of Pfizer just two days ago, and I didn't want to get, I didn't want to get vaccinated, but I got vaccinated because everybody else is getting vaccinated and you can't travel between countries without it. But it's a vaccine for a problem they don't know yet. They don't, haven't solved the problem yet, which is why the, the various variants that are occurring all over the place, whether it was in UK or South Africa or in India or Singapore or whatever. And of course, we won't call it by their country name because I understand there's a great uh, dis uh, dispute about that. But COVID-19 came out of the Wuhan, PLA-owned Wuhan virology lab. Whatever label you want to give it, call it COVID-19. So it's not against the Chinese culture or the Chinese people, but it is a bio-warfare agent. It's illegal and it's an illegal use, okay? You know, it's unsportsmanlike, uh, to use another word. You know, even war has rules of engagement and rules of engagement require that you only use legally allowed weapons, right? Definitely, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on to the next question, I want to know your views on the WHO report, which recently came out, which is a 120 <laughs> page long report, which is jointly with the Chinese experts in Wuhan. And that basically says, of course, that the SARS CoV 2 virus uh, arose in bats and, and then transmitted to humans via an unidentified intermediary animal, which almost rules out uh, the laboratory escape theory. And it has, of course, been contested by several nations, which now demand further research into it. So what are your views on this report? And more broadly, if you can tell us something about what the role of geopolitical influence of countries uh, in the WHO is. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm laughing because uh, the WHO report, uh, you know, was the, the ultimate vacation report. Uh, so, the, the, you know, these people were invited uh, and, and the host was inviting the people. The host was selecting who was coming in. If I want to come in as an inspector into your home to make sure that your house was properly constructed, do you think that you have the right to tell me who to send as an inspector, like maybe your brother or your relative? Do you think you could do that? No. Yet, that's what occurred here. So, it's, it's a joke. It's a massive joke of a global level uh, that they had Peter Strzok I mean, the, man's, the man is a cover-up artist, okay? Uh, absolutely a cover-up artist. And he's the one who, we, we're, when, you know, when we were giving $3.7 million, which is not a lot of money, it's, it's chump change. But when we were giving that money, it was going to Peter Strzok's organization to the same virology lab for gain-of-function research, okay? Now, but gain-of-function research was outlawed by President Barack Obama. Now, so, you know, if Peter Strzok is in the United States, the Department of Justice, Judge you know, Merrick Garland, now our attorney general, may have some criminal investigation to do. Was there, be, was there money laundering of government, federal government grants? But Peter Strzok 
uh, is a joke uh, with zero personal honor and zero public honor. And what he said was that it was zoonotic, it was zoonotic, it was zoonotic. Well, we now know as, you know, you got to go to a hairdresser to tell you whether you're a natural blonde or, a, or a, you know, a hair dyed blonde. So the scientists have now come out that even the virus released, now I'm going to get a little into the weeds, there are, you know, the protein of a virus, the protein of a virus is like a blockchain. Now, I, I'm not a techie, so I can't get into too much blockchain definition, but your, your listeners certainly are smarter than me on this. But I understand the concept of blockchain, which is you can't change the building blocks. Everything is on everything else, so you can't move anything. And if you do, it'll show, all right? So the protein, the, you know, the, the COVID or SARS-CoV-1 or two, these are protein strings. It's, a, it's like a blockchain. When you change something, it shows. So uh, this is lab created. No, dis There is no dispute about this. And to allow people like Peter Strzok to even have the microphone of the world to say the opposite is, is fraud against humanity, okay? Now, a very simple test of the fraud is this. All the animal farms, that were about eight, about 800 to 1,000 kilometers away from the Wuhan lab, not a single one of them, not one, had a single COVID case, not one. Now, are you telling me that, uh, I mean, that's what Peter Strzok is saying, that this virus only jumps you know, now this sounds like that great movie, My Cousin Vinny, you know, Magic Grits. You know, uh, this virus only jumps in a Petri dish in a, a People's Liberation Army-owned Wuhan virology lab when it jumps not from an animal to a human being, but from a slide to a human being. Now, come on. You know, th this is absurdity. And, and Peter Strzok should be, you know, sent to the, uh, the World Hall of Shame. Because he's the, he is he's one of the great mumbo jumbo creators, which is confusing governments of the world. Okay, do you know they only had out of the thirty days that they were in China, fourteen days they were in their five star hotel quarantined. The rest of the time they went around the world on a nice vacation tour guide, and then for three hours they were in the Wuhan lab out of thirty days, and they couldn't ask a single question or touch a single piece of evidence. If I come in as an inspector, don't you think I want to look in the microscope, look at the Petri dish? Don't you think I want to see the notes? Don't you think I want copies of the records? Don't you think I want every single effort that was made, the unsuccessful and the successful samples? They did nothing. They did nothing. And they issued a, they issued a report, which is why it, it's now, you know, it's completely a laughing stock of the world. Right, sir. So very interesting that you brought up the question of the gain of function research. And my next question actually concerns that. So just for our audience, there have been several reports which have been coming out, which states that the U.S. National Institute of Health had funded a controversial Wuhan Institute of Virology over the, in two phases, beginning from 2014 to 2019 and more recently uh, uh, in 2020 as well. So this has, of course, raised the concern that COVID-19 may have been produced through this research. So, sir, my question to you is that why do you think America would fund such a, such a controversial research? As you pointed out, the gain of function research have been uh, banned. So why would, why would the United States do that? And secondly, we've also been seeing that a lot of scientists in America have been saying that it is not a manufactured virus. Uh, it has natural origins. So do you see this as a success of China's infamous influence operations within America? Um, let me go in reverse order. Um, you know, how many good car mechanics do you know? Not many. Most of them are, are mediocre and some are, and, and a lot of them are incompetent or greedy. Okay. The same is true for scientists. Same is true for lawyers. Same is true for doctors. It's the same. That's the human bell shaped curve. Okay. So the fact that a lot of people are stupid does not make it them right because truth is not a popularity contest, okay? 
You have to understand everything that human beings do under rule of law has to go through a court. Lawyers that teach in a classroom are pontificators. Lawyers that try cases that I do in the court, when you're facing the opposition and by able adversary, the use of confrontation clause, which is to confront your witnesses and cross-examine them, that's how you scapel away the lies and the, and the exaggerations and get to the nub of the truth, okay? So even the Nuremberg trials, we had a, a Supreme Court judge of the United States stepped down at the request of the government and became the chief prosecutor. So it is always a lawyer in court who de determines the tr gets to determine the truth, not all these people who want to have other motives and other biases. That's one. Second, to your point about gain of research, you have to understand sovereignty is analog, not digital. Okay, there's a problem there. So when you look at a map, you can take them, you know, you can look around and take a pencil and go around. And yes, there may be some border conflicts, which is fine. But basically, sovereignty is a, you can draw a line around a map and say, this is, you know, this is the United States, this is England, this is China, this is whatever. Okay. And then you can say, well, and these are disputed areas. That's for sovereignty. Mathematics has no sovereign limit. Science has no sovereign limit. It's a global universe. So a mathematician is going to be peer reviewed equally well, whether the peer is in New York or California or in New Delhi or in Tokyo or Beijing. So the world of mathematics is global. The world of science is global. The learning process is global. How much have we learned from the Greeks? How much have we learned from ch the Chinese culture? How much have we learned from England? How much have we learned from the United States? I mean, so how much have we learned from France or Russia? Okay, so science and math are global. They're not sovereign limited. So in research, human development, like the Italian Renaissance, you know, Leonardo da Vinci proved, you have, it's unlimited. So it has to be unlimited. So there was nothing wrong in the United States granting other countries to go do better mathematics, okay? No problem with that. You know, that's how we get to Mars and that's how we go into interstellar space. However, the gain of function, for example, you know, I didn't go to a barber to cut the hair off the top of my head. I'm actually, you know, basically bald. Now gain of function research would say, well, for someone like me, can, can, you, can you change my genes and give me a head of hair? That's gain of function. Well, some people may like it. I'm used to just using a towel instead of a comb at this point, it's fine. I'm more efficient getting ready. But, you know, gain of function could be positive or negative, but there's a problem, there's a but. The technology to do this is American. It's called CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R. It it's, goes back to two, the year 2000. It's gene editing. Think of it like scissors, genetic scissors, okay? It'll, so a tailor would understand this very well. If you want a suit cut a certain way, they have to first cut the fabric a certain way, and then they stitch it, right? It's the, cu the cutting is more important than the stitching, okay? It's the cutting. So the scissors for the gene editing is American technology, which was created here in Berkeley, uh, UCLA, Berkeley. And China took this technology right after it was de de developed and became known for sele baby selection. You know, like people in India were using the amnio uh, uh, you know, test to determine whether the, the unborn child was a boy or a girl and then aborting, and then that was barred out. Well, in China, they were doing better. Instead of testing, they were creating children with better gain of function. So it'll be six foot tall or six foot six foot five, and you know never get fat. Eat whatever you want. I mean, this is great. I wish I could do that. Okay. So those are positive gain of functions, but you don't know if 10, 20, 50 years, 100 years from now, that is the end of the human race, right? But this gain of and that, by the way, China, to its credit, shut that down. The baby creation gain of function was outlawed by China. So give China the credit for what it deserves. They understood 
what this gain of function was, and it was diabolical. Unfortunately, the People's Liberation Army saw this as a, a secret uh, Trojan horse for, for a weapon, because, you know, it takes time to figure out the fingerprints of this. Um, so had I not, you know, invested uh, an intense amount of time learning biochemistry and epidemiology, I couldn't have written the letter to the president with clarity saying, I caught them. They're lying. It's, it's lab created. It's right here. It's hiding in plain sight. But you must take off your Peter Strzok glasses, who's corrupt, whose motives are corrupt. Would you hear a corrupt person tell you what to do? Would you listen to a doctor who was defrocked because he never went to medical school and only went to a bar and got drunk? Well, don't listen to Peter Strzok. The man's a nut job. Now, as far as funding, as I said, so advancement of mathematics and science is a global endeavor. It's a human endeavor. So there's nothing wrong when we were funding it while it was legal. But when it stopped being legal, it's illegal. And our Attorney General Merrick Garland has something to look into uh, with Peter Strzok, whether there was money laundering or federal grants. Because a, a grant given by NIH to Peter Strzok's organization in the United States may have a different grant application and then when you move the money over to PLA on Wuhan lab, that's an illegal money laundering. It's a criminal enterprise, if that's what occurred, if that's what occurred. And if Tony Fauci was aware of what was happening, then we have a problem. Now, on a positive note, just yesterday or the day before, uh, the Washington Post produced a story that George Gao, the director of CDC of China, now, CDC of China, like CDC of Taiwan or, C or our CDC, is responsible for protecting the public health. So those doctors want to, they don't deal with disease, disease creation, they deal with disease management. Not necessarily disease cure, but disease management. So George Gao reached out to Tony Fauci on March 28th, 2020, saying we should work together to get this virus out of this earth. And I applaud George Gao of China, China's CDC, because that's what every CDC should be doing, working together. And that's what I'm saying to Prime Minister Modi, forget the border for a minute, put that on hold, it's a different issue, but every government should ask President Xi, please stop. We need everything to stop. We're not gonna send you to the International Court of Criminal uh, International Criminal Court. We're not going to bring a crimes against humanity charge. Let's just solve this problem because it's even good for China. And you know, one footnote, the reason China suffered not as much as other countries is because there's a report that around April of 2019, China vaccinated all of its country except Wuhan with the TB vaccine. Now, the TB vaccine protects your lungs, which is a primary area where the coronavirus attacks. It's not the only, but it's one of the major areas. So Wuhan was, was not, that's according to the report. I'm not vouching for it. I'm just telling you it's a report. Um, so that would certainly explain why 500 miles away from Wuhan, Beijing and, and Shanghai, et cetera, didn't suffer. Um, whereas the tourists of China, when they went for Chinese New Year, all over the world, whether it was Sapporo in Japan, uh, or it was Milano in Italy, or, or New York. Um, all those tourists that went out, they were super spreaders without knowing, without knowing that they were carrying a disease. Now, that's not fair. That's not fair. You know, when, when we listen to Israel and Palestine, and we hear the term that they're using human shields, you know, when, when rockets are being fired, and I've always said to my Palestinian ambassador friend, Mansour, Riyad Mansour, you know, send roses instead of rockets and we'll get a peace better. OK, but, you know, sending people uh, who are innocent Chinese all over the world on vacation, they don't know they're even sick. They don't even know they're carriers. It's not fair of what, what occurred. But that was all up to December 30th, 2019. 
Then, like Peter Strzok, China engaged in a cover-up act. On December 30th, 2019, they went to the Wuhan wet market. You heard of the wet market? There's no bats there. There are no bats there. So where's the transmission coming from? It's a joke. <laughs> anyway, they went there because they were going to see, you know, after all, if there's a fire, the fire department has to show up at the house that's burning. Well, by December 30th, 2019, China knew that the world knew there was a fire. So they had to go to a house, but they couldn't go to the right house, the Wuhan Virology Lab. They went to the wrong house on purpose. They went to the Wuhan wet market. Oh, this is the house that's burning. And what did they do? Did they collect blood samples? Did they go do saliva tests? Did they, get, did they go around picking up animals for forensic testing? No. They took, a, they took a power wash and washed the whole place, power sprayed the whole thing, so there'd be no evidence left that there was no a virus there to begin with. Imagine. So before Peter Strzok did anything, the Chinese government did that with a cover-up fire that this is where the fire is. And by the way, we're actually using the water to uh, power wash the whole place. Imagine, imagine a detective that says, I don't want any evidence. I don't want to take any statements. I'll tell you who did it. Well, you don't want to listen to that person. Thank you, Dr. Bhatia. <laughs> My next question hits a little bit closer home here in India. So I think few would disagree when I say this, that India-US ties right now are at their highest, arguably, and the, under the current leadership. And with, we've seen frequent high visit contacts, we've seen participation within the Quad, we've seen stronger defense ties. However, America's coverage of the COVID pandemic here in India has cast a negative aspersion on the public perception of the two countries. So according to you, what steps should be taken in improving the communication strategies between the two countries to evade this problem of the negative public perception which is emerging? Well, first of all, um, Americans love India. They always have. Um, you remember that if it wasn't for Indian tea bopping in the Boston Harbor in 1773, there would be no Boston Tea Party. So the American Revolution uh, had Indian tea starring in Boston Harbor. Uh, and something John Kerry would enjoy. Second, after George, our George Washington defeated Lord Cornwallis, and Lord Cornwallis lost the colonies and had to go back to King George through his political contact, because he was a lord in the, uh, in the House of Lords, he was then sent to India. He was promoted up because he lost. You know how these things happen administratively. You know, when somebody screws up, regular people get fired. But if you're politically connected, they get promoted. Well, Lord Cornwallis was politically connected. So he was promoted to the crown jewel of the British Empire, which was India. And he decided that he was not going to lose India. And he ordered that the first 5,000 people upon his landing, men, women, and children, be killed. So they know that he was going to rule with an iron fist. So American revolution and American independence has, was started with Indian tea and paid by Indian blood. So I just want to make that clear. Second, India's great lawyer, Dr. Ambedkar, studied at Columbia Law School. He knows that after the Magna Carta, as a document, the Italian Renaissance produced a lot of genius, but not a document. The last great document of humanity was in England at the Magna Carta at Runnymede. And we created in Philadelphia the Constitution beyond the Declaration. So our separated powers regime is what makes American exceptionalism structural. Americans by, by humanity or by genes are not any better than anybody else, but it's the structure we live in, the house that we live in is better, okay? So uh, Dr. Ambedkar imported in America's Constitution to India, and, and that's Amer Indians, India's constitution is largely grafted from American constitution. So there's a great deal, a great deal of love for, for India. So it's not just currently, which is, you know, sovereigns, geopolitical interests are transitory. I'm talking about people to people love. I know Indians in India love Americans, and I can tell you Americans love Indians, it's not a problem. 
the coverage issue you're talking about is one that ought not be argued against. You know, when you get lemons, don't argue with the lemon. It's still going to remain a lemon. When I see all these uh, crematoria fires burning, you can either feel sad, and American coverage all showed sadness. Nobody was dancing in the streets. They were sad. So showing sadness is empathy. It's, it's, it's what friends do, OK? So don't argue with a lemon. Make lemonade. So as Prime Minister Modi did and, and your foreign minister, Jay Shankar, came uh, to the uh, to United States, you know, um, United States helped India. So U.S. aid, now run by Samantha Powers, who used to be the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, now is head of U.S. aid, sent, you know, the first plane that left. So that's lemonade. So don't be angry about coverage. Accept it as sympathy because the coverage is showing pain. If I'm your neighbor and I see something happening and that's people burning in your in, in your place, don't you don't you want me to be hurt? Don't you want me to show it and say, oh my God, oh my God. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shatra. This will be the last question for this interview. So I would also request the audiences to type in their questions in the chat box uh, as I ask this. So Dr. Patra. I want your opinions on what is the what is next in the search for COVID origins. Can we expect an impartial, fact-based, purely scientific study? And will US take the lead on that? And what are your recommendations on the future course of research? So there is there are studies, as I said, uh, as as in London, the article came last week that there was a study that was done last year, but it was suppressed that showed that China had altered, tried to alter the blockchain, the protein strain, the string, protein string, that tried to alter it to, you know, make it look like it was a natural blonde. So, um, and, and that article, that was not published. It's now coming out. So the mumbo jumbo, uh, which is calculated, it's bought, it's corrupt, has been uh, drowning out the truth, okay? Now, however, when people start to say, well, wait a minute, a natural virus mutates into harmlessness. This is getting more lethal. Hmm, maybe it's not natural, <laughs> you know? So now the voices of truth are beginning to grow in a garden of weeds because everybody else is getting paid one way or another to opine. So whether they're getting media celebrity or they're getting money, or they're getting whatever on the side, you know, or they're getting invited to, you know, China to go on a one month to a tourist vacation, uh, which is, you know, not bad. It's worth 30, 40, $50,000 uh, if, you, if your time has no value. Um, but as Peter Strzok's time has no value, you know, you enjoyed the 30 day stay. Okay. Uh, so, you know, so in the weeds of incompetence or corruption, the truth is beginning to emerge. And, and I would say to you the very simply, the policymakers, the policymakers have to be like Solomon. Is it a wax rose or a real rose? Look where the bee goes to. Which, which rose does the bee sit on? That's the real rose. So, because the wax rose is the mumbo jumbo. So our leaders all over the world, whether it's President Joe Biden or it's Prime Minister Modi, or President Xi, uh, because I don't know if President Xi knows fully that this is a biowarfare campaign that was launched. I don't know if he knows that. I know it was done. I know that on December 30th of 2019 at the Wuhan wet market, they released a secondary virus. That's the one that was aimed at looking blonde. So the genome of the looking blonde virus is the one that went out. The original virus that leaked from the Wuhan lab has a different protein string. So the patient zero who was at Wuhan hospital on December 1 of 2019 and the patients in Sweden in October of 2019, that's the original leak. 
The secondary leak, which then took over, uh, is the the artificial blonde, you know, made to look like a blonde. That's the study that's coming out in, in London next few days. Thank you, Dr. Batra. I think to say the very least, it was enlightening and like, we learned a lot, which was not, which is not easily available on the open source. So thank you so much. Uh, now I would like to invite Mr. Pandya for his comments and we'll be starting the question answer session. So once again, I request our audience members. Mr. Over to you. Can you hear me? Hello. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Batra. I, I mean, I just have uh, an observation or rather a question. I mean, so uh, we saw that New York Times uh, recently reported that uh, India's death figures are 10 times higher than what the official sources are saying. So as far as, you know, the American public opinion, American mainstream media houses, if they are, I mean, they're sad about what's happening in India, we really feel, I mean, good about it. But then the, this uh, the idea that the death figures are 10 times higher than what the official sources are saying, this looks a little, you know, uh, fishy. And this creates a... <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of... Look, look. Look, look, uh, reporters talk to people, right? They talk to people, they talk to government officials. I'm not standing up for New York Times at all. I, you know, I have a battle going with them, a royal, because they want to get, they, they're behind a, even a protocol that we should get, do away with title of mother and father and he and she, and we should all become it. You know, I'm not interested in that, okay? I believe in the equal protection clause, but I don't want to wipe away man is man and woman is woman. Uh, and we give away to everything else, you know. So, and we can't use today's uh, mores to whitewash, and that's that also people would argue is a, a racist term, but, you know, to whitewash the entire history in, in our own image today. We are not God, okay? So, um, to that extent, that's New York Times. So, they have an agenda, um, and they do. They have an agenda, uh, but it's for the government of India to sue them. It doesn't matter if India wins or loses in court. It doesn't matter. But you got to object. Sometimes banging on someone's door really hard at night keeps them up at night. That's punishment enough. Okay. So suing somebody. Okay. And 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 if they don't have, if they don't if they don't prove that they're because they have sources, right? So now they have to expose their sources. If they don't expose their sources, then how do they prove the truth of it? So there are benefits to the process. Due process is generally an undervalued asset of justice. I can tell you as a lawyer of 40 plus years, due process often is, is justice itself. The, the end verdict by a jury trial is a cherry on the cake. The cake is the due process. And most people don't understand that and most countries don't understand that. That due process has a huge amount of value. You get to do discovery. You get to find out where'd you go? Who'd you talk to? Why'd you say that? And by the way, you know, like we had we had an ambassador. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting old. I'm forgetting her last name. Nancy something or other, a U.S. ambassador. Lovely, lovely lady. When she was first appointed ambassador to, to Nepal, she said, you know, if you come to Nepal, I'll host a dinner in your honor. And then she turned out to be the one violating Indian immigration laws for in the Sangeeta Richards case, you know, de dealing with uh, Diviani Cobra Gade. Okay. I'm the only one who public, publicly called for her firing and she was retired. Okay. Because we don't send American ambassadors in other countries so they can violate the, the laws of the host country and commit, commit criminal acts. That's not what American ambassadors should be doing. Okay. So, um, if you want to talk about New York Times, it's for the government of India to take some action against uh, the New York Times. Thank you very much. Man. That, that's an absolutely brilliant idea. Thanks a lot, sir. So just one more question. And after that, I guess uh, Ambassador Trigunayat has also asked a very interesting question. We'll move on to that after I just put this little question. Uh, so we all got to know that, I mean, uh, over the last two years, uh, Chinese regime has cleared, like, you know, removed most of the evidence. 
So how do you look at the, you know, our, I mean, the results of the investigation which has been ordered recently? Is it going into result to something concrete or just a formality? Okay, no, 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 it's not a formality. Um, first of all, uh, what would have, look, if I was the PLA, if I was a People's Liberation Army, and I was running this lab and it was a biowarfare agent, you know, um, you, what, what would I do? I would say, okay, I had a lab leak. That it wasn't my fault, but we had poor protocols and that's in public record, it's documented. Now we had a lab leak. What do we do with this? Well, or maybe we allow it to let it go. Let's send people out as a super spreaders, right? So the first one that was an accident, you can't, you know, you can hold people responsible for being negligent and having poor protocols, but the subsequent cover-up virus, which was artificially made to look like a blonde, if you, if you remember, because there are two different protein strings. So the original Wuhan virus that came out, the accidental leak, because I have no evidence it was done on purpose. So accidental leak, the protein string is different than the one that came out on December 30th, 2019, out of the wet market, okay? Now, however, when you look at the protein string, that tells you what it is. And each one tells you it's transplanted, and each one tells you that it is artificially made, it's man-made, it's lab-created. Now, fine, so now we know that a crime was committed against humanity. Now, what do we do about that? Go to international uh, criminal court? No, it doesn't save lives. Going to international criminal court doesn't save lives because unlike World War II when Hitler was dead and defeated, the virus is not defeated. The virus is alive. It's going. And by the way, it's in the animal kingdom. We can vaccinate humanity. Are we going to vaccinate the rats? Are we going to ra vaccinate the dogs, the cats, the snakes, the whatever? And as long as it's there, and since it's already human transmissible, it can now jump. Now it's zoonotic. Okay? In fact, right now the Wuhan virus, the current virus, COVID-19, is reverse zoonotic. We're getting it, and we're giving it to the animals. It's not, it was not zoonotic in the first instance, because it was lab created, but now it's zoonotic in reverse. So we 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 have to forget about crime and punishment and forget about uh, you know a new nuremberg trials on covid-19 we need to look at disarming this so we need we need china to say your pla chief stored all of the bio data took it out of the wuhan lab but stored it we need access to it we, you know your swiss deposit box in the in the basement of the pla bunker we need access to that Okay, because we need to disarm this virus. It's it's not enough to punish the people who did it. It doesn't get us anywhere because this is a weapon that is going on and going on and going on. It's self perpetuating and is getting more and more lethal. It's mutating higher and stronger. It's like an ICBM. It's got multiple rockets. It keeps going higher and stronger. We we need to disarm it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rushali, would you like to read the question uh, read, uh, posted by Ambassador Trigunath? Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are, you are audible. Yeah. Right. So the question is uh, that could the virus be contained by reverse engineering if the vaccines are going to be less effective as virus is already standing all over? Also, Will there be joint complicity of US and Chinese scientists? Will three months of Biden to Intel community, uh, can we expect a definitive response? Let me deal with the central issue of complicity. Uh, as I said earlier, mathematics and science are, have no sovereignty. It, it's free flow of knowledge and we wanna learn everything. India, for example, rightfully takes great deal of credit for the number zero, right? The What are known as the Arabic numbers, one, zero, one, two, three, came out of India, but that's so be it. But leaving aside the credit of whether it was Indian or Arabic, the point is mathematics was at the heart of nuclear fission. So if India takes credit for creating the zero, 
Does it also want to be complicit in the nuclear bombs that get used or the testing that was done and all the human uh, suffering that followed? So, you know, the search for knowledge is innocent. Scientists are looking for knowledge, right? It's policymakers who decide who to shoot, who to target. So, the comp so there is no U.S. complicity in seeking knowledge. That's what every scientist and mathematician worth their salt do, okay? In fact, there are scientists and mathematicians who only, don't even bother with their peers because they, they don't have any peers, and that's part of the problem, right? Because when you get to be that smart, you're talking to yourself and, and disagreeing with yourself. Uh, because there's no one else who even gets what you've got, you understand. So th there's no issue of complicity here. The issue is, however, let me go to the reverse engineering. You can reverse engineer first the identification. So we're doing that, right? So the reverse identification is occurring, and we know that the protein strings are different. We know that it was made to look like a natural blonde when it's not a natural blonde, right? So we know all that. But it's so much better. Instead of reverse engineering how you made, let's say, one of my favorite dishes, you know, uh, butter chicken, for example, which is why I look like the way I look. Um, so, you know, if, if, you, if you reverse engineer it, maybe you will make the dish equally well. But what, isn't it so much easier to get the Master Chef's recipe book and have him stand next to you? So I want President Xi. He's the master chef, ultimately. He's not the one who created it. I'm not even sure he, he, he uh, approved it. Uh, he may just be stuck with a problem where some, you know, uh, rogue uh, head of the PLA uh, in charge of this bio-warfare uh, program did what he did, and now the, the leadership is stuck with it. I don't know. So the point is, but the master chef who owns the kitchen is President Xi, and we, we should ask him. We need the recipe book. We need all your notes. We need all your samples because we need to disarm this thing permanently. And the vaccines we've, we, I have just taken, I have zero confidence that it will keep me safe from every variant because it's a moving target. The vaccine is standing still while the enemy is moving. Ask a, ask a sniper. If they aim at a target, they aim ahead of the target because the target is moving. This vaccine is shooting at a target that's already left its place. So the vaccines is, is almost like, to some extent, a public placebo. But, says best as, but it, is, it is as good as we can do at the moment, but we need China's cooperation. And that's why I'm saying, going back to Desmond Tutu's idea in South Africa, because what could be more horrible in a human a culture than apartheid, okay? That's living slavery, okay? It's living slavery. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, separate but equal, we had that experience, okay? So what could be worse than that? And he said, instead of sending people to jail, what's that gonna do? Instead, let's get people to testify under oath, under grant of immunity, which means no liability, civil or criminal, but let's put it on the record so nobody will do this again. And if that was done for simple human behavior, we should do something, we need to do that for something that can wipe out the human race or the animal kingdom. And we don't know what the effect of this is gonna be in the animal kingdom. Is this gonna bring out, you know, gain of function? We don't know how that's gonna affect different animals. We have literally taken the genie out of the bottle and we're letting it spread. We need to try to put it back in the bottle. We got to try. We may not succeed, but we got to try. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, no, no, I think you're fine, yes. So, I see a question you, about Chinese. Chinese are obsessed with saving face. I want to take that. Uh, I just mm -hmm. saw that pop up. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who said it, but I just saw that. Everybody, not Chinese, everybody. We like, we, you know, we get up in the morning 
if I had hair, my hair would be disheveled. Well, before I go out of the house, I comb my, if I had hair, I'd comb it, okay? So everybody tries to look their best when they go into public. So don't accuse the Chinese of saving face or being obsessed with face. It's a human, it's a human characteristic. Use it, it's a lemon, lemonade it, okay? So I'm saying invite China to be the hero of disarming a virus that was accidentally leaked. It was accidentally leaked. So make them a hero instead of the culprit. Instead of the enemy, make them a hero. Let Use them. We need to get China involved to disarm this virus. And, I, and if, and if my, my good friend, the foreign minister of China, Wang Yi, is listening, it's a personal appeal to you. He's a distinguished diplomat, a, a, a great guy. China deserves better than having a legacy of having destroyed humanity with a virus. Uh, it's the ultimate crime against humanity. And that's not what Confucius would want. Uh, Confucius would want, may we live in boring times? I want us to live in boring times. I want Confucius to be happy. We should live in boring times. COVID is too horrible, too exciting, too terrible. Uh, sir, I think your observation about knowledge having no boundaries is a very profound observation to, for us to end this webinar. But before that, of course, I would like to thank you once again for your time and your insights. And also take two seconds to thank Mr. Pandya and the USANA's team for organizing this webinar. So if I could please request the audience to unmute themselves and have a round of applause for Dr. Batra, please. Uh, I'll join you in there. Excellent. <laughs> Thank so you. much. Thank you. It was a it was a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Uh, it's you know uh, you, you what you have just done is help disarm this virus, and that's what you need to do. We need to build public opinion to get our leaders to look a different way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.